Welcome to America's Commercial Real Estate Show, your source for market intel, forecasts, and strategies. Hello, I'm Michael Ball. Thank you for being with us. This segment is brought to you by Riga. It's Real Estate Group Atlanta. This is a group of influential group of developers, the property owners, and really all the professionals that support them. Uh, they're based in Atlanta. If you need anything with any kind of construction, uh, development, uh, anything in Atlanta, check out Riga. It's R E G Atlanta. Dot com. In fact, today we're doing the show with a live virtual audience of Riga members. So uh, they're here in the audience as we do the show today. And what we're doing is we're continuing our Corona time coverage, really covering kind of where we are today in the market, how commercial real estate participants are dealing with it, and what we should expect moving forward. My guest is one of my favorite guests of all time we've had on the show. It's Casey Conway. And Casey has a lot of other accolades and positions, but he's also CCIM Institute's uh, lead economist. And Casey, uh, really appreciate you joining us on the Commercial Real Estate Show today and uh, with uh, Riga. Thanks, Michael. Great to be with you. And even though it's a Zoom, I still brought my red shoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Well, look, we like to say that the date on these shows now, because things tend to be uh, changing fairly quickly. So it's June 2nd as we tape this, the, the curve's flattened and businesses are, are starting to open. Uh, unemployment is really just rampant right now. Uh, major industries are in trouble. Uh, and Casey, I really wanted to wait to have you on the show till we kind of got to a point maybe where we are today where there's a little bit of signals and signs. So my question to you, my first question, is there light at the end of the tunnel? Where are we on the economy today? Yeah, great question. I, I had a really good answer about eight days ago. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know where we're, where we're headed now um, with another dynamic of this thing, but um, you know, I think we're, we're, what we need to prepare ourselves for, yeah. and I've, I've had a, I've had a saying, look up and forward and engage in daily what if thinking. Looking up and forward is your only way to find that light at the end of the tunnel. Otherwise, down and back is going to take you deeper into the cave. So uh, I think we have to try to keep looking up and forward. But as we look up and forward, not all the news is going to be great. In fact, this Friday, I think we're going to get another one of these continuation of worst ever economic reports. I think the jobs report Friday will show that we have a 30% real total unemployment rate, which will be absolutely mind boggling. Uh, the U6 is the rate that I follow, the total unemployment rate. It's, it, in, in April, it hit 22.4% uh, in the May jobs report. I think this one will go above 30%. We, I think we're gonna face a kind of a W-shaped uh, recovery here. Uh, so we went down, we'll have some recovery here this summer. But I think as some of the um, intervention measures burn off um, and states uh, have to you know, get people back to work and they don't have an un unlimited pot of, um, uh, of money for unemployment insurance and everything else, we're gonna discover this fall and going into the winter the holes that we didn't plug. And in particular, I think in the other L&T industry, so we know L&T is logistics transportation, but I'm particularly worried about the leisure and travel. Um, I think the airlines will go through uh, bankruptcy rather than the government bailout program. We can talk about that. We've already seen some of the spillover from the airports, uh, the rental car companies like Hertz and Advantage going bankrupt. There's a lot more to come. When you have one in four to one in three Americans unemployed, um, we're not going to go back to 5% unemployment by the holidays. This is going to spill over into next year, at least a 10% unemployment rate the first half of next year. There's a lot of structural damage done to this economy. And, uh, so, I mean, we gotta just keep plowing forward. I think the Fed's done a commendable job throwing everything at it. I don't know what the dollar is gonna be worth when they get through. I mean, we went from a $4 trillion balance sheet to $7 trillion in 60 days. They said they may go to 10 or $20 trillion. That's almost a full year of GDP. So let's not worry about what the dollar's worth. You know, let's just buy real estate. It's a tangible asset, it's perfect hedge. Right, Michael? Just, just match us up with some good real estate. <laughs> that's right. You know, and the optimists among us I uh, would say that, hey, we're going to have a big rebound here uh, in the third and fourth quarter. You know, what, what, what's it really look like? You mentioned the W, but uh, kind of what, what's the timing that you expect? 
Yeah, so one of the things I've encouraged people to pivot to is really listen to and monitor the corporate earnings. So we just completed quarter one uh, earnings season. I honestly reviewed almost all of the S&P 500 companies' earnings. I'm brain dead, uh, more gray matter destroyed. But there is just tremendous nuggets. And as you know, most companies have quit giving forward guidance. And I pray we never go back to giving forward financial ratios because the behavior is what's really telling us what's going on. So let me use a couple of good Atlanta examples. Home Depot. So Home Depot beat on top line revenue. Um, they beat on same store sale comps, um, but they missed on earnings per share. But they missed on earnings per share for two reasons. First of all, they took, they had the audacity to take 60 cents a share and redirect it towards sustaining employees and redoing store structures so they could stay open and continue to operate. The second thing is they did not suspend their capital CapEx spending. They're midway through about an $11 billion major overhaul of all their e-commerce software technology and systems. And they said, look at the thing that's powering us forward in, in total sales, e-commerce sales and everything is this technology platform. So I applaud Home Depot for doing the right things, being ahead of keeping stores open, taking care of their employees, even those that'd be furloughed and recognizing that you have to invest, you have to spend capital to get going. So Home Depot's numbers were phenomenal. That's a great homegrown story for us in Atlanta. Um, so I looked at a lot of them. I looked at, you know, on the logistics side, someone like Prologis, they said, what recession? <laughs> you know, in the industrial and logistics se sector, they, they see no problems. They saw more requests to go find space. They did over 138 leases in April. I mean, absolutely an incredible story there. But I think where we've got to understand is, that um, put leisure and travel, for example, in, our, in focus, that's 10% of the world's GDP. And in the United States, we're the 10th largest leisure and travel market in the world. Um, and when you think of all of the towns and the places where we do business travel and airports, so one of the metrics that I'm paying very, very close attention to that will tell me how quickly we're recovering and at what trajectory is the TSA passenger count. So TSA keeps a daily count of how many passengers are going through the airports. Leading into the 1st of March, we had 2.3 million people a day going through our airports. That collapsed in April to about 85,000, 95% reduction. It's only climbed back to about 250,000, even with the states reopening in the month of May. If we don't get that number back to a million and a half by the fall or the holidays, we're in very, very serious damage. So those are a few things. I'm really studying the corporate earnings, the behavior. Um, Winston Churchill, been going back to some of my studying about how did, how did leaders guide us through things like World War II and the polio epidemic and everything else. Winston Churchill had a great quote. He says, my lateness clear, he said, in his career, he said, I quit listening to people. This isn't good news if you're a radio show host, Michael. <laughs> I quit listening to people. <laughs> I, I watch behavior. Behavior never lies. That's why I'm looking at the forward-looking behavior mechanisms. Number of people say in um, loan forbearance programs on mortgages, what happens when those burn off a year from now? What happens if people don't fly? If we stay at a million or less passengers, what does that do to our airports, our municipal bonds, city of Atlanta, uh, paying for the <laughs> operations at the Atlanta airport, all of those type things. That's what I worry about really six months down the road. Those are the holes we're gonna have to plug. We're talking with Casey Conway, CCIM economist, uh, with uh, the Riga Group members in attendance here on our show today. And, you know, talk to us a little bit more, Casey, about jobs. I mean, uh, jobs seem to be a big part of, of how our commercial real estate runs. What type of jobs do you expect to, to, have, to have trouble or, to, or even to grow? You know, what, what's it going to do to us moving forward? Yeah, so I think, you know, it's, it, this is a very structural change because we may not have as many jobs in the touch services type industry. So restaurant, hotel, uh, destination, uh, th things that where we, where we travel to, where we have to go to. We may not even see it in office. We may see an unwind of the office density ratio from one, one employee per 150 to 180 square feet. We may go back above 200. Uh, Equifax told us in earnings to get ready for a new line item called redundancy costs. We're companies that have major leases on big office buildings in downtown and dense markets. Uh, so midtown, downtown Atlanta, as much as New York or San Francisco or Chicago. And they're finding their employees don't want to go back to dense environments. They, they don't want to be in crowded lobbies and elevators. Uh, they don't want to do public transportation. Um, 
you know, or, or public disc transportation, I-285, what it used to be <laughs> um, in our city. And so what Equifax and these major companies are doing is they're looking and putting bids out for limited amounts of suburban space where teammates can still come in and meet with a customer or work on a project in more of a, a conference room type setting rather than cubicles. So I think we're gonna see even in the white collar services, we saw in the May numbers, um, uh, the May jobs report for April, 2.1 million professional service jobs eliminated. So think about it in terms of, you know, on the banking, uh, another good example, I'll give you a professional services jobs that are really disguised up in the, in the hospitality industry. Marriott in their very successful new Avalon hotel property just announced that um, they're cutting over a hundred employees at that one property, sales and marketing teams, food and beverage managers, all of those white collar professional business service jobs, over a hundred eliminated. And that was one of Marriott's new boutique concepts that was most successful in the country, only open um, two months. I think uh, manufacturing is gonna be slow to recover because not only businesses, but consumers have to restore their balance sheets. And so we're gonna be um, trying to repair the damage done by a month or two months of unemployment, getting behind on our mortgages. So I don't, I'm not looking for a real strong consumer season. I think retail can be very profitable if you can execute on click it and, and, um, and pick up or click it and deliver. Um, the container store had some real interesting uh, insights on that in their earnings. They said, look at of the 50 stores they had to close during the virus, um, that the ones if they survive and don't go through bankruptcy, the ones that they stay with and renew leases on are all gonna have a physical ability to do click it and pick up. So those that are in line in a shopping center where there's no drive through or drive up lanes, they probably are not gonna continue. So we're gonna, we're gonna see a lot of restructuring of how we do retail, how we do leisure and travel, um, maybe Airbnb is a beneficiary um, at the expense of hotels. But um, I think across the board, there's no one area, even logistics and transportation. It's gonna accelerate automation in the warehouse so we don't have virus outbreaks. It's gonna accelerate autonomous trucking, which already started in Florida and Texas at the beginning of the year. So I don't think any of us are unscathed. Well, when you talk about the wide, wide scale uh, problems there, it, it tends to make one think that possibly the recession we're heading into is going to be potentially as long as the last one. Uh, did, is that what we should think? Now here's, and it's a really good question because I, I'm kind of exhausted from comparisons to 2009. <laughs> so 2009 was a liquidity recession. Everything locked up. There was no liquidity. There was no debt. The CMBS market locked up. I was at the Fed at the time, and we, we worked really hard at the New York Fed in 2009 and 10 to fix that. And the solution was a top-down approach by the Fed. They didn't take interest rates to zero right away. Um, they were slow on policy response. They let home foreclosures develop. They didn't intervene with a loan forbearance program. And so it was put the money in the banks and hope it trickles down. And that didn't work out so great. <laughs> this one is a bottom up approach. The Fed moved very, very quickly while Congress was debating and trying to figure out how to do a CARES bill and who to, who to get to agree to it or not. And they said, look it, we're gonna go ahead and we're immediately taking rates to zero within the first two weeks of this virus. They uh, went in and started buying everything that they could, including corporate paper. When they saw that even the investment grade stuff wasn't enough, they stepped in and they started buying non-investment grade paper and doing facilities like the new Main Street right now, which is just ranking up, uh, ramping up. They're also doing ETF stocks. I mean, the Fed is really stepping in and trying to keep the liquidity from a bottom up and their, and their stated goals are twofold. We cannot let workforce destruction get out of control. If we have structural loss of workforce, this will take maybe beyond years into a decade to recover. So they're doing everything this time right up front to stop the workforce destruction and make it so that it, it, uh, it comes back really quickly and isn't prolonged. And so I really applaud them on that. I just worry how big a balance sheet uh, should we let the Fed get? It, you know, it was down to $4 trillion after getting up to $4.5 trillion. And, um, and, and we ballooned it to over seven trillion in 60 days here with a stated objective. They have to take it to 10, 12 or 20 trillion. That's what they'll do. Um, we forget there's a different type of inflation than commodity and asset prices. It's called currency inflation. And, we, and all we're doing is printing money at this thing right now. So at some point the Fed will have to worry about that, but maybe that's two, three years down the road. So I, I think the, the possibility and the option for this to be really 
quick in terms of let's say 18 to 24 months is there because of the rapid response by the Fed. They really threw everything at it this time, which we were very slow to do last time. 18 to 24 months. That sounds um, not quite so bad. <laughs> well, <laughs> talk to us about uh, loan defaults, you know, what you're, what you're seeing uh, right now uh, and, and what do you expect moving forward at, at this point when you look at it on June 2nd? Yeah, so let's look at a couple. Let's start with housing because a lot cues off of housing. So even with the loan forbearance program, we now have 8% of all more homeowners with mortgages in a loan forbearance program. To put that number in perspective, the historic high was 1%. <laughs> so going into this year, it, was, it wasn't even a quarter of a percent. So that's pretty dramatic. That tells you how many people are unemployed and having to avail themselves. If you were a homeowner that was at a 90 or 95% loan to value, an entry home buyer, first time home buyer, and you tack on a year of deferred uh, principal and interest payments, you're probably pretty close or over 100% LTV. What's their behavior gonna be like next year when they're at 100% LTV? What happens to home prices? The second one that concerns me is mortgage delinquencies. So even though we have this loan forbearance program, mortgage delinquencies in the last 30 days have doubled from 3% to 6%. So when you put the 8% in forbearance and 6% in delinquency, we have 14% of all homeowners not able to pay their mortgage right now. That has some really long-term implications uh, that we're gonna have to figure out. Let's look at the commercial side. So one of the best resources I follow is TREP, T-R-E-P-P. -P. Um, they track every permanent CMBS loan. And they said, look, we've already seen the turn coming off our bottom of 2% of or below in mortgage delinquencies, and it's now about 2.5%. But they said what you have to understand is before a loan goes delinquent, it goes into a grace period. And that grace period isn't being studied, but it's, it's pretty substantial. And then it goes, uh, the loan gets transferred to a special service or what they call LTSS, Loans Transferred to Special Servicers. And to give you an idea of how badly this is happening already, um, in, uh, uh, in April, those numbers, the loans that were transferred to special servicing in the entire leisure travel uh, segment, hotels and whatnot, it was just two and a quarter percent. In the last 30 days, that went to 11 and a half percent. So, you know, when you look at these sectors, restaurants, you look at retail, um, you look at mom and pop, small business retail, you look at hotels, um, this, is, this is a really serious situation. So I think the credit metrics are gonna be quite severe. But there's one other piece of this, one other dimension. So a lot of people look at commercial real estate transaction activity as a bellwether for health. And so up until um, the 1st of May, CRE transaction activity was holding pretty strong. It was only down less than 5%. That wasn't the case in Europe and Asia. But here in the last um, 30 days, the Real Capitalytics folks have showed us a different picture. And um, what they're showing is the transaction activity is locking up. For example, in hotels, in the month of May, there were only 10 hotels nationwide that transacted. Put that in perspective, the all-time low was in April 2009 when 21 hotels transacted. So in the first quarter, we've already blown past that record. Um, the other thing though, that's an interesting dynamic that's um, hopeful for commercial real estate is one of the reasons that CRE transaction activity has slowed down is not because of a lack of demand or interest. It's because of mark-to-market accounting. The pension funds, PREA, the um, uh, Pension Real Estate Association, uh, just came out with a report and showed um, the number of pension funds, the top 500 had gone to the sidelines, 70% um, of them had gone to the sidelines with no commercial real estate transactions until they get through their mark to market accounting adjustments on their portfolios the end of June. And then they reallocate. So they may reallocate a lot of dollars that were in hotel and retail and load them up in multifamily and industrial. I think the PREA institutional folks will come back. That's two and a half trillion dollars of transaction activity that's stalled right now that I think comes back because where do these entities find yield? Are you gonna find it in a bond that can't even yield 70 basis points on a 10 year treasury? Are you gonna find it in stocks that have suspended their dividends? Or are you gonna find it in commercial real estate where a multifamily and industrial asset still were yielding four, five, six, seven percent cash on cash? So I think the hunt for yield is what's gonna bring, bring the transaction activity back up in the second half of the year. All right, well, we're gonna take a short break and we get back, I'm gonna ask AC, KC about rent collections. You know, after these incentives burn off, 
what what are we going to get for collective rents and in office and in multifamily and then what about values uh in underwriting moving forward so stay with us we'll take a quick break this is michael bull and this is america's commercial real estate show stay with us the show? Consider referring business or doing business with our sponsors. Bull Realty is a commercial real estate sales, leasing, and advisory firm doing business throughout the Southeast, headquartered in Atlanta. Visit bullrealty.com for more information. Commercial Agent Success Strategies provides video training for commercial agents. This training gets five-star reviews from even the most experienced brokers. Learn more at commercialagentsuccess.com. You're invited to connect with us on your favorite social media. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Don't miss a show of special interest to you. Be sure and subscribe to the show on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. And at the show website, CREshow.com, you can subscribe for a weekly email announcing the show topic and guest. While you're there, you also found more videos and podcasts. Thank you for watching or listening to America's Commercial Real Estate Show.